Welcome to Applied Innovation. Hi, and welcome to Go Live from Capgemini Applied Innovation Exchange, San Francisco. I'm Andreas, your host today. Uh, today, um, we have two very special guests, and I'm excited to engage with them uh, on the topic of future of work, uh, Stronger Together. Um, we will explore um, some of the most critical characteristics uh, found in winning organizations today. Um, first, uh, cross-functional collaboration. Um, never before and across all industries, cross-functional and autonomous or near-autonomous teams are the foundation of high-velocity, agile problem solving. So that's the collaboration aspect. The second aspect, um, I'll turn to Natalie Nixon, author of The Creativity Leap, as maybe some of you have read the book. Um, defining creativity as, quote, the ability to toggle between wonder and rigor in order to solve problems. Um, according to a recent study, creative companies are, quote, more likely to report commanding market leadership position with a higher market share than their competitors. So also, as we see in the AIE uh, around the world, uh, the Applied Innovation Exchange ecosystem, creativity uh, is not a nice to have. Um, fact is that creative companies drive more organic revenue growth and profitability than their peers. So that's the reason why we at the AIE obsess with creativity. Uh, that's the reason because it is the rocket fuel of innovation. So with that said, you will absolutely understand why I am thrilled to be joined by two uh, really prominent guests um, today. Uh, we have uh, Zakiullah, Zakiullah Mohammed, Principal Product Manager Lead for Microsoft Teams, Microsoft, and uh, Risto Lechtesmeki, Founder of IDEAN and uh, Executive Vice President uh, Capgemini. And welcome to both of you. And I think if you turn on your video feeds and your microphones, uh, we will all be really glad to see you, both of you. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, excited to be here. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, such a pleasure. Uh, nice words. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's super. Um, Great to have you both. And um, just as a quick um, introduction, uh, Zaki is a lead principal program manager at Microsoft, uh, responsible for platform growth for Microsoft Teams with strategic customers and system integrators. Zaki has always had a relentless focus on user experience and the passion for solving problems at scale. So good to have you, Zaki, here. Um, and Risto, um, some of you know, founder of IDEAN and the EVP at Capgemini, um, more than 20 years of experience within the creative and digital industry with a focus on ensuring design thinking and human-centric approach. So great to have you both. And let's kick this off and maybe turn to you first, um, Zaki, if you tell us a little bit about yourself and what gets you excited today. Um, sure, uh, Andreas. Hello, everyone, again, and Zaki. Um, I'm streaming live from Bellevue. Uh, that is uh, the greater Seattle area uh, where Microsoft is based off. Um, I mean, my story is very simple. I keep, there are two parts to my story. One is before Microsoft and after Microsoft. Before Microsoft, I was uh, building and running startups. So working remotely was a norm for us over there because we were running geo-distributed teams and we had you know, contractors joining us, our, uh, our uh, endeavors from different parts of the world. So it was, it was a norm then, working, using collaboration tools as much as we can. And we didn't have the luxury of ha having you know, large open floor offices, at least in the initial part of our startup journeys. But then after coming to Microsoft, it's a whole different world where you have um, a culture of uh, everybody in one roof, under one roof, collaborating, geo uh, at a very magna scale. Um, 
And then COVID-19 happened and we are in a very different norm. And mm. I think what excites me today is just to share the innovation that Teams as a product and Teams as a platform is enabling for our customers across the globe, across industries and verticals. So I'm really looking forward to share with you those anecdotals and stories and uh, you know evidences. And in fact, I have some Easter egg goodness over here that we'll probably share with you uh, soon. Over to you, Andres. Oh, awesome, awesome. And right over to you, Risto. What gets you excited? So um, thanks, Andres. Um, um, as of today, what gets me excited? I'm looking at the world. I have to say it's a really chaotic place. And what really gets me excited right today is that I believe that I, you know, there's hope. Um, I mm. really chose to be optimistic and I mean, so for that one reason, I, I, you know, I, I have a side hobby, so I play, you know, piano and all that. So I've been working with my pals um, across the planet, six different countries to be exact, um, on a new song we call United We Stand. And I just got it today, the first final version. Wow. Um, and, you know, it's all done, collaboration. We actually use, use Teams a little bit as well. And it was a cool. amazing, amazing thing to see like how we can be unified even though in this really troubling time. So yeah. hope gets me excited. Oh, well, uh, you got it today. I hope you'll share it with us. <laughs> no one's seen it yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. If we have okay. time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it comes together. You said teams, and we're all of you know all about this creative aspect of things. So we're looking forward yeah. to hearing maybe hearing you sing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Zaki. Um, to kind of tee it off, I know Teams um, has experienced massive growth. Um, daily active users, you have the updated figures, the ones I saw the other day rising from 44 million daily active users in March to 75 million active users in April, and I'm sure that number is so much higher today as we head into June. And also we're seeing an incredible pace of new features from, you know, from within the desktop client, what happens on the back end to the iOS and Android um, apps. What's your view on the current state of things and, and uh, where we are heading, so to speak? Uh, Andres, I would first like to acknowledge, I mean, we are, it's a very unfortunate situation in which, and, and it's an unprecedented times that we are living through, but from a product um, and platform perspective and teams, we are very excited. I mean, as Satya called out in our earlier earnings call that we were able to drive two years of digital transformation in two months, then that changes the story, right? Customers were a little apprehensive earlier about, you know, using teams for collab and stuff, but now they see a very different value that it is generating for them. And it's just evident by the numbers that you were calling out. Um, I think the difference, the, the number that we announced about 44, 45 million daily active users, and then when we announced 35 million daily active users the gap is only less than eight weeks so if you can really mm. look through it that two months and under two months the transformation effect that we are having across customers is is uh, phenomenal uh, whether it is education whether it is healthcare whether it is public sector whether it is retail whether it is manufacturing across the industries and verticals uh, we are seeing a great reception b mm great feedback. I mean, mm -hmm. that is what every product manager is all about. And see, I think we're all accelerating our innovation. It has kind of motivated us to accelerate some of our investments in, in certain areas when it comes to delivering the best of experience for teams. So in nutshell, I think uh, from a product platform, uh, Microsoft in general, I think we're very excited about how we are able to help our customers continue business and innovate business. I mean, it's just not like two functions uh, that is clubbed under one. Continuity was like top of mind for people, for customers in March. But mm. now, with, I wouldn't call it a new norm. It's a debatable topic. I don't want to call it a new norm because this is not a new norm, but it's a time that I think we will get through and pass through. But the customers have now got into a state of, okay, with the current state of things, how do we innovate? Right. And uh, that is what we are uh, striving for. Yeah, uh, th thank you. I think 
I, I, um, I fully agree with you, obviously, uh, acknowledging um, the times we are in and the challenges, uh, both on a personal, individual level, um, from a perspective of uh, the challenges businesses face to, uh, today. Um, I think also to your point, uh, what we're seeing in the Applied Innovation Exchange, um, as we engage with customers in this new context, um, we see organizations uh, adjusting, adapting, and even now reaching for new opportunities in, in, in this kind of new environment and new setting. And uh, obviously we are all uh, hopeful and, uh, and um, uh, look forward. Uh, and we have this behind us very soon. Uh, and I look forward also to applying, I think, the, the kind of a silver lining, maybe the uh, of this dark cloud, um, the lessons learned from uh, you know all of this from a digitalization perspective and innovation perspective. So, to all of you out there attendees uh, joining, um, I, I do encourage you to continue to to stay safe and and uh, and you know take care of yourself and your family. So. Um, I also want to remind everyone, um, we are on Teams, obviously, um, and there is this great uh, feature in Teams where you can post questions uh, put to both Zaki and to Risto. And, and obviously, I, I, we have many Teams users uh, attending, so if you, uh, you know, want to grab the opportunity to, to ask Zaki uh, about this or that, it's, now it's a very good opportunity. Risto, um, what's your kind of take on uh, the adjustments and the context, uh, how customers have you know, engaged with you, uh, moving, you know, in this new context? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I mean, well, it's been great, to be honest. So uh, for us, as a, being a creative team, you know, um, through the studios across the planet, over 700 people, we've been working and creating remotely since 2003, right, when Skype came in and all that. And so it's, it's, it's something what we do naturally. But um, to be honest, like, uh, let's say 12 weeks ago, when uh, this whole thing started to get together and we realized that, you know, the world is going to change, mm. we started focusing and training ourselves, like, to become better on, you know, working and creating from home. So we launched this whole new program internally and externally. And, and you know, it's been received really well. So we've seen a lot of these really interesting client cases where, you know, clients, they became sort of like a little bit worried that, you know, we can't create because we're not in the same room and no whiteboards and all that. And right. so after first meetings, people were like, wow, I mean, this aha moment came through that you can actually do things even better and be more efficient uh, through mm. all this. So, yeah, I mean, we've, we've had a like, lot of good experiences. And then, I mean, we became better as well. I mean, we forced ourselves to, uh, you know, really uh, become a number one on this. Right. Yeah. OK, so. Zaki, I think we are all uh, eager and, and excited to, to hear uh, more from you and from your perspective. Uh, as I know, uh, you've prepared uh, some you know, great slides and, and, uh, and information that we want to share with us. So please do go ahead and, and I've you know, picked up your content and it's now live. Awesome. Thanks, Andres. I mean, um, if for folks joining online and hearing us, I mean, the three takeaways I want you to think about is what is Teams as a product? What is Teams as a platform? How is it going to help you uh, drive collaboration in today's context, right? And more importantly, uh, show, tell you like how some of our customers are um, really using the product and the uh, product as a platform, actually. So when we think about Teams, I mean, the first time we envisioned Teams, it was not about, hey, we want it to be the primary, we want to replace the primary dialer on your, you know, desktop or mobile that was basically coming as an alternate to Skype for business, but it was more thought about how do we create a cohesive, ubiquitous experience where people, projects, processes, and program artifacts can all come together as conversations. That is what we mean by hub for teamwork. So when you think about that, there are a bunch of things that you can break down. One is, of course, chat as a capability, calling and meeting as a capability. The third is 
If you're already using Office 3, uh, Teams today, you're part of the Microsoft 365 stack. How can you consume, bring content, surface it in the right conversation? Mm. Then the last piece, which is the most interesting, is how do you bring your line of business processes, workflows that are sitting outside Microsoft, Microsoft 365 or maybe within Microsoft 365? This could be various examples. Um, that is what we meant by Team for Homework. That was our vision what we set out for. And if you look from a traction perspective, as Andres was telling, I mean, we have today about 75 million daily active users, over half a million organizations using Teams. I mean, we are available in 181 markets with support for 53 international languages. And you just look at the sheer intensity. If you look at 10,000 or more active users using Teams today, we have over 650 organizations. I mean, that's just phenomenal. We have organizations of various sizes. We are talking about organizations that are of half a million size to organizations that are just, you know, SMB customers in hundreds. And I have always so seen startups picking up teams and using it because it just uh, gives them the cost benefit when they're part of the Microsoft 365 and the productivity benefit. Mm. So that's the traction that we have seen so far in market. Mm. And we are very, very, um, you know, humbly, um, receptive to the customer feedback and appreciate the response that we have received so far. Um, before I go ahead and talk about what Teams as a platform can do for you, I wanted to quickly share with you a customer story. Um, this is a customer in healthcare and how they are using Teams as a product and platform. So I would let um, you know uh, the video go through. Just want to make sure um, I am able to present with audio. Uh, I think last time I didn't select my system audio, so I'll do that again. And I think this time the audio should go through and Andreas, please. Yeah. Let me the audio. You're nine. Awesome. Northwell Health is one of the nation's largest health systems. What makes Northwell unique is that innovation is in our DNA. We as technology providers look to the clinical needs and the patient needs while designing the technology. The technology has to be scalable, affordable, and effective. Clinicians have to deal with a torrent of data that the patient is generating. Microsoft Teams provides a very modern platform for collaboration that all the clinicians are able to have visibility into what's happening with the patient. Families want to know everything. They want to know it in real time. And it's hard for us as physicians to keep all the laboratory values straight on 15 or 18 patients that you're seeing in a day. Nora is a bot that allows me to pull up in real time in the electronic medical record right onto my phone through Teams I can type in a patient's name and all that patient's labs will come up. It relies on search tools that are available in the cloud platform like the Azure Search and packages all of this into Microsoft Teams. It is scalable and very, very powerful. I can sit there with the family, pull up the patient's record in seconds which is absolutely tremendous. It's changed things in a way I've never expected. Nor is the first piece of technology that actually saves me time. So I can spend more time talking with my patients. The extensibility of Microsoft Teams has really opened up a whole bunch of possibilities for us. So we built an app that sits on top of Microsoft Teams and in Power Apps, which allows clinicians when they're doing rounds to be able to capture the right set of information that will allow the patient to get discharged on time. That is really speeding up our ability to react in real time to patient concerns and I think ultimately is going to make our patient care better and our outcomes better. He's creating a very positive effect in ambulating the patient and getting them back to their most comfortable region, uh, which actually is the home. So that was all about um, Teams as a platform. What you saw Northwell doing over there is like they not only using product for calling and meeting and chat, but they went and used Teams as a platform. They 
then the used underlying like the goodness of power platform, the used goodness of Azure and the goodness of Azure bot framework to build an app that allows them to pull lab test results on the go. Um, if you were to take like from when one of one of the doctors was mentioning that it helped them save time. I mean, the key thing that you need to really understand is how much time were they saving per patients and you know when custom doctors or clinicians are on rounds, they have to treat about 15 to 20 patients a day. Now, fast forward when they came into the COVID-19 situation where now the hospitals are overloaded and the beds are, they're running out of beds, the necessity to check on fa uh, patients much faster was more of an essence than it was even before COVID-19. And that application alone, where they're able to pull up the lab test results, look at the historical view from a patient perspective, that changed the game for them. In fact, they were showcased at our uh, developer conference um, um, last week by our, you know, uh, SLT members. And this is where, you know, I as a product manager get excited. The kind of innovation that customers like you in partnership with partners like Capgemini can enable, that is what is critical over here. So when you think about Teams as a platform, think about like apps in our store and apps that you can build for yourself um, by using Power Platform or using your own uh, web stacks. Yeah, maybe Zaki, uh, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned the uh, Power Platform, and yeah, you, I think you can you get in here now. So, so can you just flesh out that a little bit? Uh, what is the Power Platform and and the low code Power apps? What, you know, what's uh, can you just walk through that? Yeah. That's a great question. Today, if you want to build an application, you know, a typical route is you you hire a software developer, you invest in you know hosting, and you invest in support systems to keep that application running, um, which is which is great and um, warrants for different scenarios that behavior. But if you want to take a paper process that is out there, uh, what Notwell did was around lab test results. I know a company in creative you know, um, agency space, they were able to onboard their employees much faster. They have on paper based processes. Um, what you could do with Power Platform is you can, as a citizen developer, what I mean by a citizen developer is like an average employee in a company who can basically work with PowerPoint. If you can work with PowerPoint, you can work with Power App and build an application. And the beauty of it, it, it abstracts out all that software engineering constructs for you. So you have a storage behind the scenes automatically working for you. You have pre-built components to use. You don't need to worry about what would the button states look like. So that is what we mean by low code, no code. Empowering citizen developers, empowering any and every manager and um, grass boot, um, grassroots boot level employee right. to go innovate within your company um, to create applications to streamline processes to execute much faster to execute at quality um, that is where the power of platform comes in so so yes, essentially I, i'd say that uh, it you know using this platform power apps and low code it it, it could obviously um, uh, drive agility velocity in applying innovation and new ideas in an organization is, is, is absolutely that's what absolutely. you're seeing yeah absolutely okay. organization to organization department to department as i said if you can does you can work with powerpoint you can very well work with power app platform uh, you can drag and drop things to create forms you can drag and drop things to automate how data is exchanged between systems. Uh, it can be from Excel file to in Azure. You could do all complex pieces if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, so that is what uh, Power Platform, and when combined with Teams, you're bringing the low code, no code benefit that Power Platform provides and the collaborative aspect of Teams. You can pin it in a channel and all your team members in the channel can interact with the app now. They don't need to go install the Power App on separate devices. You're all in the same conversation. You're looking at the same thing and you're able to um, keep things moving much faster. I understand. OK, thank you. Awesome. So what do we mean by an app? I don't want to bore you with the technical uh, details of it, but when we think about an app and teams, it could be a combination of these capabilities or interfaces that we call. So there could be a channel tab. Imagine tab as a an embedded uh, page or a experience inside your channel. Um, so if you have a, chan a team with a set of channels, there's a tab that you can add in. So think about pinning a Power App over there, pinning a Power BI over there, pinning a SharePoint site over there, pinning your own 
um, you know, sites that you've built and they're living outside Teams and outside Microsoft 365. You could also think about the apps that we have already in our store. So you are you, if you're using Atlassians, if you're using uh, Trello's of the worlds, you can bring them in there. Bots, no brainer, conversational UI. Then when people have conversations, I mean, imagine if Andrews and myself, we are discussing on an approval note and Andrews says, yes, I approve this. Now I can capture that response of Andrews and send it to my LOB system. That is what message actions allow you to do. Messaging extension is more like searching and sharing information in teams. Um, task modules are like things that can help you execute workflows. And the beauty of all this is all these capabilities can, you know, treat teams as a central notification system. So whether it is people at mentioning you on a channel or replying to your thread or a bot trying to get your attention, mm. um, you can use the activity feed notifications over there. Now the back end, as I said, you can build an app using Power App or SharePoint framework or using your own line of business systems. You could leverage Azure and Microsoft Graph all underneath to surface those experiences and data and workflows inside Microsoft Teams. Um, that's that's how we think about it and quickly moving on. I mean, today in our store, we have over 600 plus apps available that you can pull up. These are apps that our ISP partners have built, so not necessary. You might be using Workboard for OKR management. You might be using Jira for feature ticket or product management. You can, you don't need to build applications. You can consume that from our store today and continue innovating within Teams. Um, Lastly, I mean, if I look at in current context, um, how are customers really using Teams as a platform? I put them into four digital transformation pillars. Firstly, foremost, how are they empowering their employees and how are they engaging with their employees? It has become very crucial now. Once you're no more under one roof where there is no uh, face to face, um, you know, touch points um, that happens. You know, it becomes it has become more for managers and employees and teams to check in with each other. How are they coping up? I mean, working remote has its own challenges and with the whole lockdown situation, um, the, the mental fatigue it is adding, the emotional fatigue it is adding, um, it has become necessary how you leverage teams over there. So we have started seeing scenarios like Pulse service. Every Friday I do with my team is something called Pulse check-in. So I check with them like every bi-weekly. Hey, how are you feeling about remote work? What is the support models you need? Whether the support models are working or not. We have apps for it to do like Disco and Karma. Um, engaging mm -hmm. with customers. I mean, business has to continue. I mean, if you're in the business of running services and selling products, you need to touch with your customers to keep moving. Um, how can you do that while working remote? Um, optimizing operations, no brainer. I mean, this is where, um, how, how are you now moving and managing operations remotely has become a key thing and care coordination in healthcare, um, delivery, life tracking, um, curbside pickups. I mean, it's interesting, like curbside pickups and stuff which has not been relevant to the corporate world has become relevant now. And more importantly, whatever is your core selling uh, value proposition, how do you tend to amplify that in today's context? How do you transform your products and services? So engineering workflows, service incident management, um, so much. I mean, if you look in today's, if I look at two last two months where the impact has been a lot and what kind of apps are getting used in our ecosystem is the right. collaboration apps like design collaboration, apps like Mural, apps like Envision, apps like Whiteboard. Um, today there is no physical whiteboard that I and my colleague can go into a meeting room and use. Now we have to do it remotely. We have to share ideas. We have to continue the innovation. Um, and more importantly, one of the trends we are seeing, Andreas and, and folks on the call, imagine, I mean, every company has an innovation center, right? Mm. Earlier, we used to invite customers for to our innovation centers and show them the best of our product and service and people offering. But now, when you have to continue your business, when you have to continue um, transforming products and engaging customers, how do you do that virtually now? And what was now we have come to a realization, hey, before COVID, our innovation center approach where we used to fly people down and do a, a focus session was an expensive affair because we had to plan mm -hmm. for it, we had to set up the travel for it. But now everything moving online, not only has it helped us save costs, but I think the feedback that we are receiving from customers is it's more engaging. I feel more uh, involved 
It's not uh, just a jargon of content through at me. So that is the behavior we are seeing in today's context. So with that, mm -hmm. um, that is all I had from to share with you from Teams as a product and platform. Over to you, Andres. Thank you, Zaki. Actually, I'll just uh, take that part you said at the end there with the whiteboard and, and uh, direct everyone's attention to the live event Q&A. And uh, actually, one of the questions uh, coming in from, uh, from our attendees uh, to you, Zaki, what's your recommendation for hardware slash software to conduct a whiteboard session for Teams? What's, what's your take on that? I love uh, using Surface um, Hub with uh, Teams. I mean, it's amazing. Um, we do have whiteboard in Teams meetings coming and then um, we do have like some of our uh, third party partners published there. So definitely Surface Hub plus Teams. Um, and I mean, what the price points were like two years back, it's no more that of a challenge. In fact, not as we are seeing more of our, you know, leadership members and our employees who are in the business of uh, design thinking and, uh, you know, visual thinking, using it more often. The second, if you don't want to go that, you know, broad, you can in fact use your iPads as well. You can use your tablets as well. You can use Teams on those tablets and you, I can have a meeting running on my desktop. I can join with my iPad and I can do my whiteboarding on my iPad as well. So I can mm -hmm. screen share on my iPad device with Teams and I can use the any app that I am comfortable with. So mm -hmm. that is also working. So I'm on the call on desktop attending the call and I use my, um, you know, iPad as a second device to foster uh, visual collaboration. Mm. I understand. So um, out of the different scenarios you uh, you outlined, you see teams use, you know, engaging with employees and, and uh, customers, obviously supporting business processes now with low code and power apps, you, you can easily design new types of support on the platform. Um, what, what are some of the more surprising uses that you've seen uh, of teams? Um, I think obviously stronger together is a very important theme and and you know pulling individuals, persons, teams together. But what are you know some of the surprising uh, implementations you've seen? Um, I can tell you in in the recent context, which was mind blowing. Uh, I'm not like NFL. Um, um, the National Football League wanted to run their drafts, um, and you know drafts is like a physical activity where all the participating you know clubs have to or the teams have to come in. And we were able to turn that around, like use teams to do NFL drafts. That was a game changing moment mm -hmm. for us coming together as one Microsoft. And the interesting part was the time we had in hand to work with NFL to really do that. So that was one. Um, the other is more importantly is um, the healthcare. I mean, this is time and repeat we have seen happen in the current con unfortunate context uh, situation is virtual concerns. Imagine mm. now, as I said, like what Northwell is doing is they have to do a patient check in. But if you're a patient check in and you're going in, in, in an area which has a lot more COVID-19 infected patients, um, how would you be able to do that? And now we have seen healthcare providers using devices set up in certain rooms to the doctor and the clinician are not really there. They're able to do virtual consults and virtual check ins to cover not because they're um, they're worried about their personal safety, but they're more worried about how many patients can they see in a day um, and how can they extend it. So that's one scenario that has come out. Um, you know, I can go on and on, but these two are uh, yeah. fresh on my mind in the current context. Uh, thank you for for um, those examples and also sharing uh, your views, perspectives on the Teams platform. And I'm sure we're going to uh, get um, so even more questions, we have more questions coming in, but I I obviously also want to turn um, over to you, Risto. If you turn on your video feed and your, your microphone, uh, I, I think that it's super interesting and, and extremely relevant uh, today uh, to look at um, how do we engage together as teams in, in problem solving, from a creative point of view, obviously some of the elements that that uh, you know connect to creativity and working together uh, in the same room physically uh, working together has, you know, obviously 
certain elements that is maybe challenging or not to replace virtually. And you know, from your point of view, Risto, uh, I know you and your team have many years worked uh, in, in you know highly creative environments, uh, even built uh, really uh, super cool physical environments to kind of mimic what you're actually going to build for for airplanes and cars and all of that. Uh, super cool. How do you cope with that kind of thing now? Uh, in this environment, uh, are there any any best practices or ideas that you can share with the attendees? I'm I'm, I'm sure many are interested to learn about this kind of, kind of connection. Yeah, I mean, thanks. That's a great question. So, I mean, of course, first of all, as we all, we need to adapt, right? And in a way, the, the fact that now, as everyone's working and creating from home, we are like on the same sort of like setup. And you know everyone's facing the same challenge here, so it actually helps because now you know the whole environment and you know the whole the platforms are same, and everyone's like really working from the same uh, angle. Um, and yeah, I mean, so we we basically, for example, what comes to creating from home and and brainstorming and all that, um, we set up a whole new sort of offering and a practice where. You know, we start learning like using all these these different tools. Like there are like dozens of different uh, services one can use, and you know, possibilities are endless. And so my, you know, I mean, tips or tricks might be like, well, first of all, um, you need to start thinking of your culture. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to set up everything around the culture you have. And these times are actually really interesting because um, when you have a creative culture, it just empowers it, right? Um, and I think the you know everything we are experiencing here is just amplifying what you have already. So uh, you you need to find ways to how you um, you know relax the people in part of when you are doing the uh, workshop or, or creating from home, and you need to f try different tools. I mean you really need to go uh, outside of the box. There are like again like a couple dozen different tools one can use. Um, and 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 you need to find the ways and the tools that are really suitable for yourself. Uh, facilitation is super important. I mean, it's a really really hard skill to have, and so I encourage every organization to uh, you know find and identify those people who are able to right. bring energy back to a sort of virtual room through the through a, you know calls like this, and and then you know just spread that and and let everyone learn. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's uh, really interesting how you start off by not going straight to tools, uh, but you are actually mentioning the culture. Yeah. I think mainly also behavior and how we work together, how we encourage uh, you know creative thinking and all of that. Um, and then obviously the role of the facilitator uh, in in creative yeah. sessions. Um, super interesting. Do you have any? Any uh, stories to share? Any, any uh, good? Uh, yeah. So, what? Yeah. Your... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I got a bunch of slides here, so I, I'm I'm ready whenever you're ready. But um, we're ready. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll share my slides and then we'll go from there. Wait a sec. Uh, can you see? Yep. We can see, and I'm I'm sending. I'm sending it out live and now we can see your slide. Super. So um, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I mean, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to tell a little bit about our, you know, great from home uh, thing and, and the practice we set up, but also like to explore a little bit the future, like where we are heading to, because I mean, it's not just really like about like what tools we are using today, but for what we are using uh, those tools as well. Um, and, you know, as a reminder, Risto, I'm originally from Finland. So fellow uh, with my Swedish friend Andreas and, um, and as an art director, uh, really excited about to be here. So I wanted to start with a little uh, film. So when again, like 12, 13 weeks ago, I realized that we need to really focus on like our, our skills and you know, super skills on uh, creating from home. We you know, set these practices together and then you know, created a little film, um, 35 seconds. So here we go. Thank you. 
right? Um, so one thing we, um, this is not just about like, I mean, you can go online and find a lot of good tips and tricks about like how to run these workshops and like how to be more efficient online. But uh, to me, it comes down to a one really important piece, like how do you lead better mm. and, and through online? And so uh, here's a little interesting stats we found uh, from Stanford, like remote work actually increases innovation by 68%. I mean, and this was done before COVID. So I expect this, these numbers uh, and there are going to be a lot of uh, new uh, research mm. on this. Mm. Um, and so when I'm thinking like what the future of creating or working from home, so I, I took a liberty to Google a bit this morning and no, right. I mean, this was the world before uh, COVID. Everyone's like, well, you're working from home, right? Um, and you open a beer like what, 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, this is sort of the, the dream we have about working from home. This is really the reality of the working from home. I, I think everyone mm -hmm. in the audience has experienced some of this, right? Or this, uh, more or less. Um, to me, it's more like almost like a having a, a broadcast station when you are working through online uh, tools and different like uh, uh, apps and, and services. I mean, you need to really facilitate that like really efficiently so that everyone has the same flow than we used to have in, in the real world. And you know, just an example like we love Jamboard. I mean, our team, they're working and uh, trying to make things a little bit more fun as well. So, uh, you know, my, my dear colleague Whitney, she always says, when you can add fun, add fun. And and that really is important now uh, when we are working and, 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 you know, we don't have that physical uh, touch and, and presence we used to have. And, you know, just example of some of the tools we've seen and, and been like really working, um, you know, through teams and, and all that. Um, and, you know, we love some of this really. And I think this is super important for for uh, anyone in the audience, like to go through and explore and like find the ones that really work for your need and your workflow. Um, and, you know, just like one uh, example from my own past, like literally like what 12, 13 weeks ago when uh, we started to really realize that this COVID is going to be a, a real thing. Um, and I was wondering like how to run and like how can we run IDN, you know, around 700 people and without really meeting anyone. And it really felt weird, right? Because I mean, I remember we had this one um, all hands meeting and like hundreds and hundreds of people. And I had like this little window here and my stupid face on the thumbnail and then, you know, text messages and Slack and, you know, you know what uh, um, people texting me and I was trying to run the whole thing without really having that you know, the connection, you know, you normally have when you have people in the same room. And I think in the future, going forward, I mean, there will be a, I mean, obvious like um, someone hopefully coming out, like providing that experience where you can start reading the room, you can like build atmosphere, um, you know, there's not that awkward pause like five minutes before the, the, the whole thing starts. Mm. And, and, you know, even like somehow, um, you know, have a proper interaction between me and the audience. Like, I mean, we everyone has a phone. I mean, we could utilize that like whole different way than we are uh, utilizing today. And even thinking like the whole holistic journey of any meeting or any conference, like it, where it really starts when it, the, the, you know, the invite comes in, like, you know, is that part of the experience? And when you start a meeting, like what happens, uh, how you make that, so that it's it, it supports the storytelling and it's not just like you know like video feeds mm. like going back and forth mm. uh, and 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 you know one thing i i read a research where there were some like um you know feedback from the people and what really people are missing as well is like what happens after the meeting like that just a casual like you know walking away from the meeting room uh you know going and grabbing a tea or something and having that chat chat and you know decomp decompressing of what happened in in the meeting and so we for example we found out like we just stay and hang around for a while and try to replicate the experience we used to have in a in a real world but uh yeah i really think that uh in the future there will be a, a 
platforms and that will support like leadership as well, not just like conferencing and just like, you know, um, making this sort of technical thing happen in a proper way. Mm, I understand. This is really a solid experience sharing. A quick question regarding that kind of whole journey around, um, you know, a creative work together in a team. You kind of mentioned it quickly around the uh, importance, relevance of actually preparing really well. I mean, if yeah. you have a physical, you know, workshop, you prepare the space and you set things up and then you welcome everybody. That's kind of an experience. You run it together and then what happens afterwards? You kind of hang around you and then so looking at it from a whole kind of journey perspective, uh, what what's your view on like the relevance of, of that uh, in in a creative virtual perspective? How well, do we do that? I mean, it, it, it's of course super important. Um, it's more important than ever. I mean, today it's not just about like um, preparing for actual workshop or meeting. It's also like we need to take make sure that everyone are able to use and they know how to use these tools. They're relaxed, uh, you know, and so that technology actually helps us to achieve our goals and not, uh, you know, preventing that to happen. And you know, I mean, we, for example, just like interesting finding, like uh, when you run a workshop, like let's say 50 people or 100 people, and like two to four hours or even longer. I mean, it's a lot of time to, you know, you know, be in front of the the laptop mm. screen. Uh, you know, you need to. You know, create a rhythm where people can actually like take proper breaks and and you know uh, so that we all stay creative. We found out like you know when you run these larger uh, workshops, you need to have probably like one facilitator around like ten people so that and I mean when we do like breakout rooms or like you know little right. like uh, side workshops, um, there needs to be a you know moderator for each of those and. And there are ways to make this so that you know there's a, this master moderator who runs through all these different uh, environments and right. yeah, it's yeah. interesting. So, so maybe Zaki, I want to turn actually over that to you. Maybe you're already jumping on that. Uh, you know, what's what's your your perspective on that? You 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 manage obviously your teams, and there has to be you know a creative you know culture running these sessions, which you do. What's your kind of uh, advice or, or or experience in this setting, so to speak. Yeah, the most important thing I get asked about whether you're talking to a student or whether you're talking to a professional is how can I avoid a bad meeting on any platform, whether it is Teams or anything else. Um, the most important thing, and Risto brought up a great point, is you definitely need a, like if you're running workshops, if you're doing, uh, you know, uh, brainstorming or what I would call as thinking activity, um, you definitely need a great facilitator. One of the things if you start looking at once uh, as a trend we are seeing with some of our customers is they have started hiring workshop facilitators these days and mm -hmm. whether you're running a project meeting or whether you're running a, a brainstorming session, whether you're doing a risk mitigation and all, you know, uh, war room situation, they have started creating this facilitator role within their organization in recent times, wherein they are responsible for making sure people are prepped. See, from a meeting point of view, there is a life cycle. Mm. There is a pre-meeting work that needs to happen. There is an in-meeting work that needs to happen, and there is post-meeting work that needs to happen. Meeting is no more yeah. about, hey, let's jump on a call and let's have a 30 minutes chat. Uh, you need to set the context. You need to get people motivated, people aligned before the meeting actually happens. Mm -hmm. um, so we have started seeing, you know, what does that mean from a culture perspective, process perspective, and that is business, and what mm -hmm. does that mean from product perspective? And I'm sure you will hear more from Microsoft coming out around how we are thinking about uh, meeting as a life cycle, meeting as an entity. We don't want to yeah. treat meeting as an experience. We want to treat meeting as an activity, which is there is a life cycle at all, uh, associated to it. So right. that's changing. So from culture, we are seeing today what could have been a water cooler talk or what could have been a side chat. Um, my calendar right now, I think the biggest challenges that we hear from our employees, my directs and across our peers as well is, hey, my calendar is over, like overbooked. I have multiple conflicts. I'm spending at least 20 to 30 minutes just fixing my calendar in a week. Um, because now, even if I want to have a chat with Risto for five minutes, I'm actually booking a slot of 30 minutes because that's what your tool by default is designed to do. 
right? right. So that is creating a fatigue and people are like, OK, how do I get smart about time and attention management in these days in remote work? That is from culture perspective, from a business process perspective. Um, how are organizations setting guidelines when you should have a meeting, when you should not have a meeting? I don't think there's yeah. a guideline, but what facilitates a great meeting? People are focusing on that. Um, on the people side of think it's more about, hey, how can you help me get work done faster? That's the key thing uh, everybody's asking. And I think uh, if you ask, I mean, from our perspective that I hear our customers and as well as my own directs and employees saying is, there is no more Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's only yesterday, today and tomorrow. Uh, that is what our work weeks are looking now. Uh, because it's getting spilled over and managing that and doing it through teams has become critical. So right. what we have done in teams and especially we are seeing this with we we kind of advocate it with customers. We kind of advocate it internally as well. Uh, preach only what you practice is before any meeting set up good guidelines on where should I go and gather context. What should I come to this meeting for? What am I required for in this meeting? And what are the action items? How do we follow up? So we have used planner boards inside teams. We have used Trello boards inside teams, which manages this life cycle uh, very uh, cohesively. Right. So um, I'm I'm looking at uh, some of the questions coming in and we're coming close to top of top of the hour, but there's still um, time to to post questions if you do have any. Uh, the new ones that I have come in kind of uh, relate to what we're talking about now and and uh, the um, experimentation that I think is happening uh, across many organizations. Uh, you're experimenting on, on tooling, you're experimenting on platforms, you're finding out new features, uh, new formats. So it's kind of an experimentation phase I think we're going through and also you know led by how we behave differently obviously in this new context uh, obviously forced in many ways um, what's your take on moving forward will we kind of remain in this constant uh, phase of experimentation or will we kind of now we'll nail kind of the the ways of working um, and uh, how we creatively engage how we set up meetings all of that or for how long do you think this kind of open experimentation will you know, continue, should it ever stop? I can probably take that one. So time has called us times as the greatest remote work experience, uh, experiment in history mm -hmm. of mankind. And it's obvious, I mean, with everybody moving offline, um, basically when I say offline, moving to work from home. Um, one of the things that we are seeing, um, it's when you look from a data perspective, Gallup has this interesting poll done, a study done, um, wherein in March they kind of interviewed the participants and asked them, how many of you would you like to work from home? Mm. And interesting, oh, how many of you would you like to work from office? So 38% said uh, we would love to work from office. This is in March. Fast forward, I think sometime in April, mid-April or third week of April, same participants were asked the same question. How right. many of you would you like to work from office? And astoundingly, same audience of that, 47 or 46 percent, I might be quoting that number wrong, we can do a fact, 47 percent wow. has quoted saying we want to go back and work from office. Yeah. So there's a value. There's a value because it brings yeah. in, it, it helps you build relationships. It helps you today working on a new relationship and trying to nurture that relationship is a very extensive effort when you're trying to build alignment around projects and programs all remotely. When right. it is an office and people are around, it's much faster. Um, right. So I think people are realizing that. So whether this norm stays, I mean, there are multiple, there are different school of thoughts propping up. If you ask a small organization, they see a cost benefit. Um, but if you ask a large organization that cost benefit versus the productivity gains, uh, the rationale is very different. Uh, we as Microsoft, we would love to come back and work from office as much as we can. I think I'm personally, when I say Microsoft, I think our leadership was also, Satya had this remark. I mean, that touch, personal touch is missing. Um, yeah. That is what I'm looking forward to come back to work and work. Um, right. Some tech companies decided, yeah, you know, we're going to give the ability for our employees to work remotely anyway, because I think it works. It depends on what function you are in. If you're in a function which needs you to connect to machines and operate them, 
um, yeah, you would need to be in office. If you are a knowledge worker, information worker, um, you know, design, even design thinking, I'll argue, you still need to probably, can you do everything remote courses? Can you do, it's a debatable topic. Some really do well, uh, some are yet to figure it out. So yeah. I don't think it's going to be a debate for a few, few more months. Right. And once I think the, the situation around COVID-19 changes, I, I'm very hopeful that we are going to come back to the norm, which is basically in a very hybrid manner, maybe not the way things were as it was. I think companies and corporates are going to become more uh, open to creating certain policies which give uh, the benefit of working remotely. Right. right. Well, thank you. I, exactly. uh, Risto, I'm going to head over to you also. Uh, just a quick question, Risto, to you, uh, and you can build on, on what Zaki is saying. Um, applying innovation is not just about finding you know, the right you know, things to do in the right way. It's also about removing obstacles and challenges. Um, what, what's your view if you want to build on what Zaki said, but also if you have a, a, you know, an, an experience to share or view uh, regarding what potential challenges that we need to address from a creative virtual working from home kind of thing, what, what would that be? Great question. Um, I'll, I'll answer with one case study, a case we just had an experience. So I uh, can't name the client, but it's a client who um, you know is building medical hardware, and and it's really really like sort of life saving uh, like uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And we had a plan, like uh, just like a few months back, the plan was like to have an in person clinical re research to inform a redesign effort. And, and followed by user validation testing. And obviously then when we wouldn't be able to go and meet people and we had a hiccup. And so the event was time sensitive and you know would need to occur while uh, shutdown and quarantine measures were in place. Mm -hmm. and, and so that put us in a place where we had to be like, well, this sounds like a problem. Like, how can we do this remotely? And so the, the, the pivot we had was that we found a doctor who was willing to secure an iPhone to their head and setting up additional mm -hmm. iPhones for multiple angle research uh, recording. Mm -hmm. And so we used, uh, you know, these platforms and Figma and for, you know, other platforms to, for that user validation testing. And it was like, you know, you can imagine the client was like, wow, and we were wow. And and so that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, you just throw in a little bit creative thinking and problem right. solving and you kind of overcome all these obstacles. That's a great, great anecdote, great story just to, you know, continue to solve problems creatively like that. Yeah. Thank you. Zaki, uh, your final remarks or summary of the conversation and what you're seeing uh, moving forward. Uh, we have a, a few, uh, half a minute or so before we wrap up uh, top of the hour, but uh, words go over to you. Yeah, I think uh, this thanks first of all, uh, Andres and team and Risto for the opportunity, uh, I would say for having me here um, and to the folks who have joined us online for taking time out and hearing us. Uh, interesting perspective. I think the times are challenging. We're going to continue uh, doing our best as everyone would. Uh, but the more important thing from a product and a platform perspective, I think what I have been very um, looking forward and in all contexts is like how our customers are not just using Teams. I think the maturity curve is shifting. And then when I say that is they're not just talking about calling and meeting anymore to us. They're talking about all these scenarios that they can light up in Teams using platform and its capabilities. That is what gets me excited and that is what keeping me like waking up every day like in the morning and I look at this is the problem we need to solve. Um, I think it's more about that in minute gains that each right. individual makes using your product and platform and when you amplify that the volume and the size of the organization, the effect net effect is madness. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what brings smiles to our face and we cherish that moment. Um, unfortunate, but I think customers have adapted to innovating now. They are over right. the hurdle of adjusting, as you said. They are adapt now moving into how do we innovate in this in the current situation and continue to innovate. And mm -hmm. it's very exciting to see how Teams has been playing a critical role in it. Yeah. Thank you, Zaki. Thank you for sharing uh, today, um, joining from Microsoft and uh, and also thank you for, for joining Risto. It was great. Uh, engaging with both of you uh, on this uh, critical topic. Um, 
Future of Work and Stronger Together. Uh, it actually concludes our series of uh, three go live events on this specific topic. And the San Francisco Applied Innovation Exchange team um, in these three um, events uh, pulled together uh, six partners from the Bay Area uh, to engage in different views, perspectives on this topic. Uh, we are here wanting to engage with all of you um, and uh, want to bring the best uh, of the Silicon Valley and Bay Area uh, to your context and to uh, engage with any opportunity and challenge uh, that you may face moving forward. There's just one thing that I would wanted to kind of extend to, to all of you um, in this context to, to kind of finally wrap this up. Uh, and this just um, encourage you today um, to reach out to one of your team members or a couple of them uh, with a word of encouragement. Say something positive and constructive to the person. Uh, make someone feel really well about what they're doing. Um, that's my advice to you. And, and um, we've uh, uh, had a great time engaging with all of you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, Risto, uh, Zaki, thank you so much, and uh, yes, we'll be back soon again with another Go Live event. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.